everybody and welcome to Insect Classification Online. I'm Georgette Pleiters, please call me Georgette, and I'll be leading you through your studies and investigations in insect classification. I'm talking to you today from beautiful North Wales in the middle of summer here, and I can't wait to get to know each and every one of you as I interact with you throughout the term. Now I've personally got a background in vector-borne diseases of livestock and humans, and I've got a personal interest in classification and identification using both morphological, morphometric, and also molecular methods. I've spent a considerable amount of my academic career collecting diptera, specifically Coolicoides biting midges or noceums, from countries around Europe in order to aid in better identification of species there that are disease vectors, and also novel methods of both vector and disease control. Just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Since this is an online course, and many of you are off campus, I've got no set office hours, but please, please do communicate with me as much as you can during the course. I'm here to help, whether you're looking for further information, clarification on a topic, you need help with your collections or equipment, or you just want ideas of how to delve further into the syllabus, I am here to help. I hope you enjoy the course and please do contact me if you need anything. In each of my lectures, you will see these little icons. Pause the video, click on the icon, and you can either write on the modules discussion board, email me directly, or find links to more information on what has been covered during that part of the lecture. You can also book a meeting with me over Zoom, Microsoft Teams or Skype by clicking on the schedule a meeting icon. As the introduction to your insect classification course, we're going to be spending the next 10 minutes looking at the importance of insect classification to society. We're going to be focusing on what classification is, why it's important, and how it is relevant to society. Taxonomy is the science of classifying living things. It's essentially the Dewey Decimal System of evolution. So it's like filing. Okay, I can see I'm losing you here. I'm gonna move on. So when it comes down to it, the science doesn't just categorize organisms. When you look a little bit deeper, you realize it's telling the story of all life on earth. And it's a pretty good story. Every living thing is related to every other living thing. If we go far enough back, we'll find something that you and I are descended from, or something that a palm tree, a human, and a fish are descended from. The trick of taxonomy is working out where all those branches of the evolutionary tree are, and finding some convenient labels to help us understand all of these interrelationships. But just to be clear, taxonomy isn't about trying to describe life in all its intricate detail. It's mostly about helping humans understand it, because it's far too complicated without structure. To get that structure, biologists use the taxonomic system to classify all the organisms on Earth. It's often called a phylogenetic tree or a tree of life, and illustrates the evolutionary relationships between all living species. Taxonomy is probably one of the world's oldest professions, from naming what we eat to what we run away from. Aristotle was believed to be one of the first to note that to understand anything, we must classify it according to its parts. But names came about as more of a description at that time, and generally in Latin. Take the name of the European honeybee, for example, which used to be known as a... Um, phew. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? And that roughly translates to hairy bee, underside of the thorax grey, brownish abdomen, back legs smooth, with outer areas on both sides having fine hairs. Yeah, back then, names could become polynomial to the point of no return. Thanks to Carl Linnaeus, however, the European honeybee is now known as Apis mellifera, the honey-bearing bee. Carl Linnaeus was a Swede, born in 1707, and early in his career as a botanist, he realised that the botanical nomenclature of 18th century Europe was pretty poor. New plants and animals were continually being discovered in Europe, but with many, many more coming from the New World, Linnaeus saw that eventually naming conventions were going to collapse. He once said, I shudder at the sight of most botanical names given by modern authorities. Well, I'd like to take that one step further and say that I also shudder at names given by members of the public when naming conventions aren't in place. As an example, back in just 2016, there was a proposal by a British government agency to let the general public suggest a name for a $200 million polar research ship. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time, until it went viral, and the runaway favourite name was 
Boaty McBoatface. Well, it was certainly descriptive. The science minister decided there were more suitable names, and the ship was instead named after Sir David Attenborough, despite the name coming last in the poll. But this just highlights what can happen if naming conventions aren't in place. Sorry, I digress. Back to Linnaeus. So Linnaeus offered a solution to 18th century classification, which was binomial nomenclature. To use two words, no more and no less. The first part is the genus, always capitalised, and the second the specific epithet. Together, they're italicised and give the species or scientific name. Linnaeus devoted himself to the study of nomenclature. The method he finally adopted was based on morphology or physical form and structure. While this wasn't novel, he had a knack for choosing homologous traits for his naming system, traits that stem from a common evolutionary ancestor. Okay, let's recap. Taxonomy is the science of dividing or classifying living things, and classification is arranging those things into groups according to observed similarities. As humans, we do this because the world is complex, there are many interrelationships, and humanity has the innate desire to understand and organise what we see around us by structuring it. In this case, a binomial nomenclature is used to define each species. So, Now that you know that biologists use a taxonomic system to classify all organisms on Earth in order to get structure, you might still be wondering why it's important to have a binomial system in order to name insects. Surely it's not enough for humans to have an innate interest in doing so. We name insects because if you don't name something, you have trouble communicating. So imagine for a minute if you had no word for, let's say, chair. Sometimes you could give a description, but it'd be very time consuming and also confusing. Humans have individual names for the same reason, and it makes communication much easier. It's crucial to identify an insect or species, because then you'll know if it can, for example, transmit malaria or not, if it will damage your oranges or not. So this is important due to the global aspect of entomology. The practice enables those in different regions and countries to use the same name to discuss an organism. The second thing about classification is that hierarchical grouping helps us to identify related organisms and to describe evolutionary relationships. If we know that two species are closely related, they're likely to have similar characteristics. So if one biting fly has proved competent to transmit a particular virus to livestock, A closely related one might also show competence, even if it's not found in the same region. Taxonomists describe and classify new species by comparing characteristics shared by a group of organisms, which may be anatomical, behavioural or even molecular. For example, in several families of Hymenoptera, the larvae are completely dependent on the continuous care of the adults. Or if an insect you find has six legs, it's a hexapod. If it can't fold its wings over its abdomen, It's part of the subclass Paleoptera. When we know how insects live, what they eat, and how they interact with their environment, we can use different strategies, such as integrated pest management, to manage them around our homes, crops, other spaces that we may share them with. We also need to know if an insect is beneficial to our environment, so we don't want to hurt our pollinator friends or insects that eat pests. Insects do not respect international borders, and the movement of people globally alongside the effects of climate change and environmental usage means the introductions of non-native insects are becoming more common. In order to conserve and monitor native biodiversity, we need to know what species we have, where they're found, and how their numbers or diversity are changing over time. What do you call this insect? Pause the lecture now and write your answer in the discussion box below. So that leads us to question, how is insect classification relevant to society? Taxonomy is a profession in its own right, but if you don't want to be a taxonomist, why should you be interested in classification? I'd like to begin with some classification blunders. Do we really care if people misclassify things? Let's begin with the Infernal Dictionary, a book describing demonology organised by hierarchies. The most popular edition was in 1863, which included illustrations of several of the demons, making the name Beelzebub synonymous with Lord of the Flies. How many pairs of wings do you see in that image? Then we have educational books. Sadly, it seems like the publisher picked any image they thought vaguely represented a bee and landed on not even a hoverfly, but a housefly. 
Journalists reporting on new discoveries and attaching photos of entirely the wrong insect. No, that's not a mosquito, that's a crane fly. On to pest controllers. Here we have an insecticide producer for mosquitoes. Two things here. Uh, when did mosquitoes become their own order and not a member of flies? And secondly, the diagram of the fly on the left hand side that they say doesn't suck blood. Well, unfortunately, that is actually a tetsy fly. And in fact, both the males and the females are blood suckers. Unfortunately, this type of communication means that members of the public often get the wrong idea about many insects. Classifying insects isn't a solitary profession. As you can see, a lot of people use classification in their everyday lives without even realising it. But correct classification not only makes communication easier, but also more accurate. Those who can classify insects make great contributions to such diverse fields as agriculture, chemistry, biology, human and animal health, molecular science, criminology and forensics. The study of insects serves as the basis for developments in biological and chemical pest control, food and fibre production and storage, pharmaceuticals, epidemiology, biological diversity and a whole variety of other fields of science. People spend more money on protecting their homes from termites than they do on hurricane damage. Insects cause more death and disease than any other organism in the world, as competitors for food, vectors for diseases, human and both animal. Yet life as we know it wouldn't be possible without them. And thanks to their abundance and diversity, you can study one every single day and never get through them all. Time to recap. Can you remember how to define taxonomy and classification? We classify because the world is complex. There's many relationships and humanity has the innate desire to understand and organise what we see around us by structuring it. The classification of insects can be complex, but it's very important to group and identify insects so that they can be studied reliably and communicated correctly. Insect classification has evolved in different phases over a considerable period of time and continues to evolve. Insects are considered the most evolutionary successful animal on the planet and the most diverse, so they aren't easy to classify. But knowledge of classification avoids miscommunication and enables the study of beneficial contributions to all areas of society. The goal of this course is to provide you with a sound theoretical and practical understanding of insect diversity and the practice of classifying organisms. I hope you enjoy the course as much as I've enjoyed making it. The following activity will focus on these learning objectives. Your first activity is collaborative classification. I'd like you to use the discussion board to introduce yourself and a common hexapod from your region. Next, you will need to work as a team to produce an online identification service for the duration of the course. Finally, you'll individually introduce two hexapods of your choosing to a scientific and lay audience on social media. Step one, introductions. Introduce yourself, where you're from, and what you do for work or study. Give us an idea about how insects fit into your society. You can find my own example on a discussion board. Then, introduce a common hexapod from your region. This slide shows a list of ideas for you to structure your introduction to the class. Remember this slide from earlier? Meet my hexapod, commonly called a ladybird in the UK. Don't forget to chat to your classmates about their hexapods on the discussion group, where you'll find my hexapod too. Step two, collaboration. As a group, you'll provide an online identification service for the duration of the course. The Entomology and Nematology Department's Distance Education Program has dedicated Twitter and Facebook accounts. As a group, you'll select one of these accounts to provide identification services from. You'll be required to discuss and agree on an identification for each request and respond on that form of social media. Identify as far as you can. This doesn't need to be to species. And finally, step three, extension. As an individual, you are introduced to hexapods using social media. One should be introduced as if to a scientific audience, the other to a lay audience. These should be insects that you have collected as part of your collection. Include a photo, explain your collection techniques, the habitat you collected your insect from, and how you curated and identified them. If you're a graduate student, one of these insects may be the one you have chosen to be your featured creature. You'll find full instructions for these activities here.